Okay, everybody, let's get started. Good evening. My name is George Sarah Nicolau. I will be hosting tonight's uh, event. Welcome to the final briefings of two of our sustainability programs, the Master of Science in Sustainability Management and the Master of Science in Sustainability Science. This is uh, the Capstone Workshop is a special course in both of these programs in that it requires students to synthesize and apply the knowledge and skills that they have gotten throughout their respective programs to a real world sustainability project. Students work uh, in teams throughout the semester on behalf of clients trying to solve or at least address real world sustainability problems. So in this course, they step away from the classroom and into the shoes of sustainability practitioners. Um, and this is our way of giving that sort of experience, that sort of real world experience to our students. The projects that you will hear about tonight vary. Um, they have to do with uh, places nearby and places very far away. Um, the sustainability management uh, projects focus on organizations and management, the sustainability science capstone workshop briefing that you will hear at the end of tonight's program. Um, uses science to solve a real world problem. And I'll be talking about that later on in the program. But while the projects are different in many, many ways, you'll notice that students also um, use very similar kinds of skills. So data analysis uh, that is based on uh, the limitations of data collection in, out in the world um, and um, a synthesis of um, knowledge and, and that, they, that they obtain from various sources, clients, uh, through benchmarking, uh, through desktop research. Um, and they, their work involves often financial analysis, organizational analysis to come up with uh, recommendations to their clients to, to try to address these problems. Uh, each of these teams has worked hard under the supervision of um, faculty advisors, and um, I'll be um, introducing them throughout this program. Uh, the first one, the first project we'll hear about next was advised by Eileen McGinnis. It has to do with uh, a regional market for greenhouse gas emissions, and Mia Swirley is the student presenter. Uh, I'm going to ask her to make her presentation in just a second. I just want to say that at the end of uh, her presentation and each of the remaining ones, we will do a five-minute Q&A, which I will moderate. I will ask you to uh, raise your hand virtually using that Zoom feature, and I will call on you to ask questions of the presenter. I'd also like to ask everybody to keep your cameras on as much as possible so that we can make this evening uh, as interactive as possible. Um, in an ideal world, we would all be sitting in the same large room, enjoying each other's company and learning from each other. We have to do it by Zoom tonight. So let's do what we can to um, to try to stay connected and, and make this event as interactive as possible. Okay, so with that introduction, welcome Mia uh, and take it away. Perfect, um, you can all see my screen, I hope. Great, um, so hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. My name is Mia Surly and this evening I will be presenting our Capstone project the expansion of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI for short. First, I would like to thank the entire team for their tireless work, as well as Eileen McGuinness, our esteemed faculty advisor, for her support and guidance. Tonight, I will be begin by presenting our clients and our project scope, 
before delving into how we went about solving the task at hand. I will then share our final recommendation and our proposed next steps for the client. At the end of the presentation, as George mentioned, we welcome any questions and feedback that you might have. Cutting emissions from power plants is one of our most important levers to reduce climate change and local pollution. Reggie, <clears throat> Reggie came into play in 2009 in the absence of federal policy when states wanting to cut emissions needed a program to move forward. Reggie is a market-based cap and trade program that 11 Northeastern US states participated. Reggie helps curb CO2 emissions generated from the power sector by cutting, by setting a cap and assigning each participating state an emissions allowance. This is based on the emissions generated by a state's power plants operating at a capacity greater than 25 megawatts. Reggie then reduces the cap by about 2.5% a year in order to achieve CO2 reductions. Reggie runs the quarterly auctions where power plants buy carbon allowances while states in turn receive their shares of the proceeds. Now, Reggie is a sizable program uh, with 11 participating states together accounting for 20% of the US economy. In addition, Pennsylvania, marked in lighter green on this map, will be joining Reggie in 2022. And with this inclusion, Reggie states will account for nearly a quarter of the US economy, which could have pretty major implications for future emissions reductions. What's incredibly in, uh, encouraging to see is that as a consequence, consequence of Reggie's cap and trade program, as well as other emissions programs, Reggie states have seen a 50% decline in power sector emissions. Further, states use the auction proceeds to reinvest in the clean energy economy. As such, Reggie, Reggie's model has proven successful in not only emissions reductions, but also in other societal benefits, such as improved health, job creation and consumer savings. For example, uh, the largest participant in Reggie, New York, has used Reggie proceeds on energy efficiency measures and investments in clean and renewable energy. Going forward, New York will also ensure that 40% of the benefits will be realized by disadvantaged communities. Now, before we move forward, some of you, some of you might ask how uh, a national climate change policy such as the carbon tax under the Biden administration could impact the expansion of Reggie. But based on our extensive desktop research, as well as feedback from Columbia University affiliates, we believe it is unlikely that there will be a federal carbon tax. Reggie therefore provides a great platform for states who want to do something about their emissions without having to spend the time and resources building up their own cap and trade scheme. So now that we have that out of the way, um, let's move over to, project, to the project scope. Reggie can only be successful if states actually participate in the carbon uh, cap and trade system. As such, Reggie welcomes new states that want to join. However, our client candidly admitted that they do not have the resources or the time to look ahead and identify good candidates. So this is where our capstone team comes in. Our project scope was twofold. First, identify factors that would make a new state favorable to Reggie participation. And second, based on these insights, recommend potential states to participate in Reggie. We structured our project in two phases. In the first phase, we developed a scoring tool in Excel to rank the 39 states that are not participating in Reggie. In phase two, we began filtering the scoring tool for secondary indicators that would prove a state's true visibility for participation. This research culminated in six US states that the Capstone team recommends Reggie to pay special attention to and potentially recruits. In phase one, we first reviewed a range of data sets from industry recognized sources and added the most relevant to our data scoring tool. Then to ensure optimal calibration of the scoring tool, we conducted a series of expert interviews. We were fortunate to interview a broad range of stakeholders from local, state, and federal governments, as well as nonprofits. We structured our data in three categories and weighted them according to likely impact on whether a state would and should participate in Reggie. Based on desktop research and expert interviews, 
we identified that political landscape should be weighted the highest at 40%, followed by economy at 35%, and health and environment at 25%. Further within each category, we used a range of data indicators, as you can see on the left side of this page. On the right side, you can see a simplified version of our extensive scorecard. So once optimal calibration of the scoring tool had been verified by national experts, the Capstone team began filtering for uh, secondary qualitative indicators that would prove a state's true feasibility for participation. Now, this was a, a big uh, lesson learned for us. Quantitative data analysis only gets you so far. Although our data sheet proved very valuable for understanding the makeup of all the 39 states and ranked them according to visibility for Reggie participation, in order to truly identify a state that would be suited for Reggie participation, the phase two deep dives were critical. In phase two, we included several considerations, including political environment, strength of local environmental advocacy groups, and legislative precedents. Further, our clients had a special interest in contiguous states as agency heads of Reggie states tend to know their counterparties in neighboring states. This interest was also based on their desire to reduce what is known as leakage. Several Reggie states are part of a regional interconnection called PGM, which uh, coordinates the movement of electricity across state borders and includes some non-Reggie states. Leakage is a concept that electricity generation would shift away from Reggie states that tax their fossil fuel plants to non-Reggie states that do not tax them. So in phase two of our analysis, we therefore prioritize states in the PGM interconnection. However, uh, we did not, this did not constrain us from considering other states further away that we saw as more compelling candidates, as you can see on this map. So based on all our qualitative and quantitative uh, data analysis, we ended up with six US states that Reggie should pay special attention to and potentially recruit to their cap and trade program. These six states are Illinois, Louisiana, Minnesota, Michigan, Georgia, and Ohio. Three of the states are within the PGM grid, while the remaining three are outside of this area, but still possess characteristics that we believe them possible. We believe make them possible candidates for Reggie participation. In our client report and briefing, we will go into detail about the rationale for each state. Specifically, we have created a deep dive of the political landscape, key emission sectors, economic overview, and health and environmental impact. For purposes of this presentation, however, I will now shed some light on the commonalities of these states and why we believe they could be good candidates for Reggie participation. The first is that political will is critical for Reggie participation. Time and again, we were reminded in interviews and in our research that without the political will, the potential for Reggie participation is slim. All the six states that we are recommending have political momentum about climate primarily identified either through having climate plans or initiatives. We do want to note that although executive will is the most important in terms of participation, having a legislature that agrees with the climate agenda is incredibly valuable because as we know, executive decisions can be overturned. Further, given that industry is an important influencer on political will, support from industry is very valuable, um, including public support for climate action. The second thing to pay attention to is the state's energy mix. In general, if the state is only reliant on coal for power generation, our analysis shows that Reggie participation is unlikely in the short term. All the six states we recommend use multiple fuel sources, making a change in, in energy mix feasible. Now this ties back to the feasibility of being able to cut emissions through other power generating sources but it also says something about the feasibility from a jobs point of view. States that have started to migrate to other energy sources have started to train their workforce in clean energy jobs, which can build a favorable base for Reggie participation. For the purposes of next steps, we are very excited that in addition to our final report, we will be sharing two resources that Reggie can utilize immediately. The first is one-pagers with all the most important information about each state. 
Our client believes that this information can be easily shared with potential registates. And as such, we are providing these to registate utility and environmental commissioners to share with their counterparties in the states that we have identified. We will also share our comprehensive Excel scoring tool with Reggie along with instructions for how to use it so that Reggie staff can use this as a quick reference guide when they want to learn about the political, economic, and health and environmental impact situation in any states. We are very excited that these tools can be implemented in the short term, and we will definitely be watching news about Reggie expansion closely to see which states end up participating. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and uh, we can now take any questions. Thank you very much, Mia. I'd like to ask uh, those who want to pose a question to Mia to use the raise your hand function and I will moderate. Mia, I'll, okay, so we have a question from Hannah. Go ahead, Hannah. Hey, Mia. Thanks for a fantastic presentation. That was super interesting. Um, Louisiana seemed like the farthest non-contiguous state and also might, um, I know Texas is an isolated grid, but might have access to other fossil fuels. Um, I'm curious about the key factors that, that determined Louisiana's eligibility specifically. Right, so for each state, um, we have been doing deep dives and all the different things that I mentioned. Um, in terms of uh, Louisiana, Specifically, I think their, their mix of energy, their energy mix is, is feasible or it makes it attractive to, to change and, or to contribute in the cap and trade program. And then they do have political momentum. Um, and in terms of specifics, I would uh, refer to my, my colleagues, but I think um, just in general, those two made it really interesting for us to look at. I would just highlight, um, just to follow up on Mia's um, comment, that um, Louisiana recently had an executive order signed by the um, by the governor, which is putting in a task force in place and having a climate resilient um, manager choose who's they're going to start to think about how they can reduce things in their energy sector. So we saw momentum there. Thank you. All right. Other questions for Mia? Hey, Mia, I'll ask you a question. Uh, why does the energy mix matter? Um, in you know making a state more likely to participate, is it what, what is it about the the Reggie business model that that makes that an important factor? There's a couple of the different things, and uh, number one is that if the entire economy is based on coal production, uh, trying to limit that will have a big impact on jobs. And in our interviews with uh, different experts, they did emphasize that the most important a barrier for participation is jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, so if the state is 100% reliant on coal, that will make it very, it will make it harder to, to push through essentially. Um, so that's that's the main main reason why, why that's important. Um, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Nicely done. Um, you are done with Capstone, congratulations. Um, all right, yes, virtual applause all around. Um, okay, let's move on to our next presentation. Um, unfortunately, this online format doesn't uh, really lend itself to taking breaks between presentations. So um, everybody take a deep breath, settle into your seats, and here we go for our next presentation. This one uh, brings us to um, Mount Vernon, New York, just, just outside of New York City. Um, we will hear uh, a presentation about sustainability planning for the city of Mount Vernon. Thomas Abdullah advised this team and Hannah Wolf will make the presentation. Hannah, you're up. Thanks so much. Um, all right. uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Hannah Wolf and I'll be presenting on behalf of our capstone, Sustainable Mount Vernon, Developing an Implementation Plan. Uh, my group includes our project manager, Casey, and our deputy project manager, Caroline. We are joined by Rubana, Danny, Martha, and our faculty advisor, Professor Thomas Abdullah. Um, yeah, As discussed in the midterm briefing, our client is the city of Mount Vernon, which is a small city located in Westchester County, just north of the Bronx. 
Its population is about 68,000 people and is an environmental justice area with about 80% of the population being part of the BIPOC community. Our specific points of contact contact are Robin Mack and Mayor Sean Patterson Howard. The mayor took office in 2020 after a contested mayoral election and has been faced with many challenges that go beyond classically defined sustainability. One of the forefront challenges is a historical lack of reinvestment in the community while being located in the second richest county in the state. The mayor explained it as, um, like, quote, Mount Vernon is kind of the rotten core of the golden apple that is Westchester, end quote. Um, while there is a sense of hopelessness among residents, there is also a feeling of immense pride and care. The mayor brought us on board because she recognized how our community has been negatively affected by environmental justice issues such as poor air quality and food insecurity. And while she understands that sustainability initiatives can help mitigate these concerns, the city has had a history of developing plans that were never implemented. This has been largely due to the lack of science-based targets in these plans and political will. Knowing this, we wanted to provide the mayor and her administration with baseline information and tools that will help them achieve their plans for sustainable growth. We also wanted to provide them with a plan that, that could stand the test of time. To this end, we determined that sustainable minded thinking must be embedded into Mount Vernon's institutions and governance structure. We have taken great effort to consider and incorporate equity into our proposed initiatives. What makes this plan unique is that we, we focus on the low hanging fruit and easy implementable actions. It was our overarching goal for this project to catalyze change through small steps that the city can implement quickly and for relatively low cost. We believe that through partnerships with existing groups and programs, established initiatives can snowball into significant change, improving the city for future generations. To produce our deliverable, we had a process flow to guide us and utilize um, several methodologies. This slide resembles our original expected flow, which showed the mainly linear process of a kickoff meeting and organizing our concerns into four main sectors, transportation, buildings, wastewater, and power with assigned task leaders. We then expected to move to research, decision-making, revisiting assumptions, identifying challenges and opportunities, and prioritizing goals with a bit of circularity. However, this was not the case. This is a more accurate representation of what actually happened. Our flow became truly fluid as we kept having to reevaluate our goals, decisions, and research until we eventually had to move forward and create our final deliverable. One method we utilized was to contact diverse stakeholders, including local environmental groups, utilities, concerned residents, and government entities to ensure we are considering the input of the community. We conducted a site visit to familiarize ourselves with the city, as well as analyze precedents to see what goals and initiatives are already out there. It was very important for us to build on the success of similar communities and keep in line with city and state targets. We also collected data and established a framework to provide Mount Vernon with the ability to make science-based targets. We did this through the utilization of subject matter experts to ensure quality data. Gathering data ended up being a significant challenge for us. An important lesson we learned in this area was that it was best to capitalize on existing relationships rather than trying to build our own from scratch. For example, through conversations with community group Sustainable Westchester, we met a former Mount Vernon employee who had an existing relationship with the current DPW commissioner. Our data requests to the commissioner were not yielding any responses. When we asked her a new connection to facilitate the conversation and request the data on our behalf, we got a response within hours. We also utilized Columbia resources like Professor John Dickinson to help us produce our GHD inventory and GIS librarian Eric Glass to find alternative resources for geospatial analysis. Through our research, we discovered that there are many existing public and private programs with available funding opportunities that Mount Vernon could plug into, but hasn't, mainly due to lack of knowledge and action by previous administrations. These findings shifted our focus from not only to what the city can develop, but also what the city can participate in, essentially not reinventing the wheel. The most important thing our plan provides are the tools for Mount Vernon to implement changes in each sector, as well as base level measurements that can be revisited to show overall GHG reductions. We want to set Mount Vernon up for success, not failure, and our final deliverable will be their guide. To give you an overview, our deliverable will be an implementation plan in the form of a report. The plan focuses on overall emission reductions derived from science-based targets. However, social indicators, specifically concerns of equity, play an important role when deciding on what areas to focus on and what actions to prioritize. The report is divided into the four sectors, and each sector includes one to three initiatives. The initiatives outline goals, benefits, past actions, precedents, funding opportunities, and short, medium, and long-term actions. 
the specific fleshed out implementation steps are mainly focused on the short term actions. I will go through some of the initiatives that we focus on, but as the slide shows, these do not represent all of our recommendations. For the building sector, our goal is to reduce the overall emissions associated with buildings through reducing the energy demand, lowering energy usage, and electrification. One of our key initiatives is to retrofit existing residential, commercial, and municipal buildings to make them more energy efficient. A quickly implementable action includes assisting homeowners and renters to take advantage of energy audits provided by the utility, which will reveal inefficiencies and opportunities to optimize the building structure. Additional actions outlined in the plan include the creation of a workforce development strategy to ensure that economic benefits of energy retrofit and construction are equitably distributed. For the transportation sector, sorry. For the transportation sector, our goal is to reduce transportation emissions and ambient air pollution while concurrently facilitating and encouraging the adoption of sustainable transit options. One key initiative is to install EV charging infrastructure. Through our evaluation of data, we determined optimal locations for equitable access to charging stations, as well as funding opportunities to ensure widespread adoption. The transition to EVs addresses environmental justice concerns by improving air quality through the decreased reliance on pollutant emitting gasoline cars. Additionally, the construction of EV charging sites will send a noticeable signal to residents that they can buy electric vehicles and have reliable locations to charge. The purchase of an EV, which can also be partially subsidized, leads to lower vehicle costs over the lifetime of ownership, meaning that lower income, resident, lower income households and residents will see a greater proportional increase in the amount of money they have available to spend on other goods and services. The map on the left is a representation of traffic and commuting data, which shows the percent of residents with commute times of over an hour. The map on the right shows household income data that we have layered with the locations of city owned parking structures. These maps highlight the need for cha charging structures beyond just municipal parking lots, which can achieve more equitable access. This charging infrastructure will also create an economic benefit for the city through a new revenue stream from operator lease payments, which can then be reinvested to help fund the conversion of the city's municipal fleet to EVs. Con Edison's Power Ready and Electrical Vehicle Fast Charging Per Plug Incentive Programs can help streamline this initiative through providing financing and advisory services for the construction and operation of charging stations. For the waste sector, our goal is to reduce energy emissions by increasing the amount of solid waste diverted from incinerators and the environment, as well as decreasing overall waste production and consumption. One key initiative is to reduce organic waste from entering the waste stream. Reducing organic waste, specifically food waste, not only reduces the amount of refuse sent to landfills and incinerators, but will help Mount Vernon combat inequity by reducing food insecurity. One key action for this initiative is to develop a food scrap recycling program. Since fall 2020, Westchester County has had the residential food scrap transportation and disposal program that Mount Vernon can utilize. This program lets any Westchester municipality pay a subsidized rate for the transportation and disposal of food scraps, either through curbside or drop-off collections. This makes the collection process neutral, so there is no additional cost for Mount Vernon to now have food and other organic materials collected separately. The map shows where the specific waste streams would be going should our proposed actions be implemented. This program could be implemented as soon as the end of 2021 through partnership with Scarsdale, New York. After speaking with Scarsdale's green team, they are very eager to help and engage with Mount Vernon to get them involved with this program. As discussed, the ability to act on the plan was of significant, significant importance to us, but the implementation of any of these initiatives, initiatives is reliant on a strong governance structure to oversee its execution. This includes the creation of a sustainability committee and a paid sustainability manager position. While establishing paid positions, the city can also focus on amplifying the voices of different leaders who we have worked with, such as the Public Works Commissioner, local environmental activists, and organizations like the Federated Conservationists of Westchester County. Our immediate next steps will be to present our plans to the mayor and Mount Vernon residents. In this discussion, we plan to get feedback and revisit some of our initiatives based on their additional recommendations. The mayor has made it clear through conversations with the public and with the federal government that sustainability is essential for her administration. We believe that our plan will provide Mount Vernon with the tools that they need to reduce the city's emissions and to team up with local county and state groups to enact feasible and substantial solutions. Thank you for your time. Um, please see the specific organizations listed on the slide that we would like to thank and specially acknowledge and we welcome any questions. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, questions for Hannah. Please uh, raise your virtual hand and I will call on you. 
Hannah, while we wait for our audience to ask questions, let me ask you the first one. I'm wondering uh, in the transportation part of, of the planning that you did, um, whether you know, mass transit was an, a, a viable option. Uh, in your presentation, you focused on electric vehicles, um, but I'm just wondering if mass transit also plays a significant part here, especially because as you say, Mount Vernon is um, a community that has you know, a significant uh, number of low income residents. Yeah, we definitely looked into mass transit and it's not something we don't consider. Um, they have two main stations that they utilize. One is definitely more um, nicer than the other. One is kind of abandoned a little bit and needs some love, if you will. Um, and we, from the midterms uh, presentation, I think it was like 30% of residents actually use mass transit. Everybody else uses their own cars. Um, so that's something we want to encourage people to use mass transit because it's very easy for them to get to the city. Mass transit is a huge option for them should they be going to the city. Um, but other mass transit options we're looking at is like including like electric scooters and bicycles, just other means that they can use to get around their area besides vehicles. But since it is such a vehicle heavy location, how can we deal with that? since it's what they're doing right now. Okay. Are there any other questions for Hannah? George, I have a question. I tried to raise my hand, but that may or may not have been successful. Yeah, I didn't see it, Suzanne, but please go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Hannah, thanks for the presentation. Could you talk a little bit more about the food waste program and how those partnerships, how did you estimate um, those partnerships um, and, and what the impact might be um, in terms of greenhouse gas reductions of a food waste program. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was in charge of food waste, so I'm really happy to talk about this. Um, I, Great. Yeah. Um, if you ask my team, like I literally don't shut up about it. Um, uh, so the food waste program was started by Scarsdale, New York. They were the people to start it in Westchester County and has since transferred to 25 different municipalities. Um, and what they had noticed before is they you had to have a contract with a separate vendor. And they noticed that was not really equitable and lower income communities were not able to opt in. So like I mentioned in fall 2020, Scarsdale New York's green team had gone to somebody in Westchester County and they came up with this deal to have New York, Westchester County subsidize um, that uh, the vendor for food waste. So it's a collection process that's neutral and they can have as many drop sites as they want. Before, if you had like three drop sites, you would have had to pay for each drop site. Now it's whatever. And it's still covered by Westchester County. And to calculate to your question about the emissions, we did do the greenhouse gas inventory where I calculated waste reductions, assuming, um, I took liberty in assuming that about 40% of their waste is organic and 22% of that is food waste. So I don't really think everybody is gonna do it, but assuming by 2030, you can get like a 20% um, participation, you can see a relatively significant reduction in the food, uh, in the waste part of emissions. Great, thank you for the explanation. Yep, thanks for the question. Hannah, we have another minute and a half. I'll sneak another question in here. Uh, so, but please make your answer brief now. We're down to a minute. Um, you talked about building uh, retrofits and you recommend uh, taking advantage of the audits that the utility offers. Uh, what happens after the audit? How do you convince people to actually retrofit those buildings? Is there money for, for, for homeowners to do that? Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not super familiar with the building <laughs> sector, but I do believe there is money through Con Edison. They have um, uh, programs that you can apply for grants to to help you with the retrofits. And then there are other groups in there that have funds and grants for that. Oh, sorry, nice sort of. Okay, thanks very much, Hannah. Nicely done. 
we applaud you. Um, and uh, out of the din of all of that applause, um, we move on to our uh, third presentation for the evening. Um, Steve Childred, I'm, I see your federal hand up, but I, I unfortunately we've, we've ran out of time. I'm sorry I didn't see it in time. Our next presentation um, has to do with um, the waters around um, our area, the, the New York Bite, as it's called. Dr. Robert Cook was the faculty advisor for this project, and John Trevellini will give us uh, the presentation. John, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our capstone presentation, 30 by 30, Marine Habitat Protection in Busy Ocean Waters. Our team advisor is Dr. Robert Cook. Our project manager is Steve Doherty. Our deputy manager is Nikita Varma. The team's researchers are Kimberly Davis, Rian N. Gulick, and Bing Feng Song. Uh, and again, I'm John Trevellini. The New York Seascape Initiative, our client, was launched in 2010 at the New York Aquarium as a conservation program. It's designed to protect the waters surrounding New York City through research, education, and policy. Our project will help the New York seascape identify areas where realistic conservation measures could protect 30% of New York's marine habitats by the year 2030. Well, what is a realistic conservation measure? To date, the United States has conserved 27% of its oceans as highly controlled, governmentally recognized marine protection areas. But most of these MPAs are in remote areas of the Pacific. To protect a wide array of biodiverse habitats, the International Union for Conservation of Nature realized the need to move beyond MPAs and consider new options to preserve habitats. In 2019, they developed criteria for Other Effective Area-Based Conservation Measures, or OECMs. Now, these OECMs are an emerging instrument for conservation. Currently, there are no other effective conservation measures in American waters, but OECMs are necessary to meet global conservation targets like 30 by 30, the target that New York Seascape has adopted to conserve 30% of New York's waters by the year 2030. Determining if other effective conservation measures are applicable in New York is the crux of our project because human activities in New York's waters make them unsuitable for full protection. But conserving marine habitats is necessary. So OECMs provide an opportunity at balanced conservation. Our task is to provide the New York seascape a toolbox that helps them identify candidate areas of other effective conservation measures and achieve the 30 by 30 target in this region. Well, a study of a vaguely defined area like Waters of New York would be inaccurate at best. Our project considers areas of human and natural use within the spatial limits of the New York Bight. A bight is a curve in the coastline. The New York Bight extends from Cape May, New Jersey in the south to Montauk Point, Long Island in the north and into the deep waters past the continental shelf. The New York Seascapes area of study also includes the Long Island Sound, and the Hudson River. The New York Bight has a broad range of habitats. Some key habitats shown here in the New York Bight include tidal rivers and streams, wetlands, and at the continental shelf break, canyons and cliffs home to over 70 species of deep sea coral. Many other species also live in the Bight. Over 200 types of fish call these habitats home. Six whale species travel through the New York Bight seasonally. The migration path of humpback whales, shown here, is similar to many marine species traveling through the Bight. Commercial fishing, sand mining, and recreation are billion dollar industries in the Bight. The port of New York and New Jersey is the busiest American port on the Atlantic. The green and blue lines here show vessel transit counts. The Bight's offshore wind areas, the colored polygons, have the energy potential to power two New York cities. Our background research will provide a foundation to further the seascape's understanding of how other effective conservation measures might be applied in the New York Bight. 
Our four project deliverables construct a toolbox that the seascape can use to identify candidate areas for other effective conservation measures. The toolbox includes a database of managed areas, a library of relevant literature, a list of potential partners, and importantly, an evaluation of the recently developed criteria for identifying candidate areas as OECMs. To provide the deliverables and build Seascape the toolbox for decision-making, our project was organized into five phases. In phase one, we determined three areas of study. Phase two, we conducted eight interviews with subject matter experts. Phase three was building our library, the database and list of partners. In phase four, we analyzed our findings. And finally, we applied the conservation criteria to habitats in the New York Bight. Our main challenge has been that other effective area-based conservation measures have been the subject of many recent papers, but few have actually been put in place. Much of the literature we reviewed on OECMs has been published over the last three years, and the gaps in research have been an obstacle to making definitive conclusions. However, the work on our deliverables has uncovered key findings. The database with its two sections of geospatial resources has nearly 220 entries. This database will help New York Seascape with their planning. Stakeholders in the New York Bight already use geospatial tools to manage their interest in these waters. Information in the database can reveal conflicts among multiple uses and help identify candidate OECMs. The first section of the database is a list of repositories where links to spatial data like shapefiles can be accessed. The second section contains a listing of all managed areas in the Bight. This includes conservation and industry managed areas like state parks and wind farms. The library is a listing of recent literature on other effective conservation measures. Our review of literature for the library informed the identification of candidate OECMs for the New York Bight. The library has 150 entries searchable by title, topic, author, and organization. It also includes citations and a summary for each entry. The New York Seascape is also interested in forging new collaborations with partners to aid in its 30 by 30 goal. Some likely partners we've identified span governmental bodies, NGOs, and the private sector. For example, the New York Seascape can partner with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They can engage with NGOs such as the Billion Oyster Project or team with private companies like Orsted, an offshore wind company. Our final deliverable was evaluating the effectiveness and relevance of the criteria for identifying other effective conservation measures in the New York Bight. In 2019, the International Union for Conservation of Nature provided four tests to evaluate whether or not an area might be an other effective area-based conservation measure. Areas that pass all four tests can be considered candidates. In a moment, we'll look at how these criteria are applied. The results of our study have revealed many areas that show potential as OECMs. Areas we defined as candidate OECMs include offshore wind areas, ecological corridors, and the waters near 100-year floodplain zones. So let's apply the conservation criteria to an area in the bite and show you how our project might be used. The inshore waters adjacent to the 100-year floodplain, shown here in blue and green, are crucial habitats for marine life while also being critical areas for coastal infrastructure as New York prepares for climate-induced sea level rise. The Living Breakwaters is a coastal infrastructure project to increase resiliency in the 100-year floodplain. These partially submerged rock mounds off the coast of Staten Island are seeded with oysters. Here is a cross-section drawing. It combines a traditional offshore breakwater that absorbs waves when they before they reach the coast with an oyster reef that restores marine habitats while increasing the size of the breakwater as the oysters mature and multiply. Well, we can now apply the four tests to our project. In test one, the area is not a recognized conservation area. Test two, the 100 year floodplain is a spatially defined area and it is managed. 
In test three, living breakwaters are meant to grow over years and may ensure long-term conservation. Test four, this is an area-based conservation target compatible with coastal resiliency. So the Living Breakwaters Project may be an ideal candidate other effective conservation measure. The seascapes can use the deliverables in our toolbox to identify likely areas and then use the criteria to test its feasibility as an other effective area-based conservation measures. We hope our project will be helpful to them as they hone their strategy to meet the 30 by 30 goal in the New York Bite. On behalf of our team and the New York Seascape Initiative, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I invite your questions, feedback, and suggestions to help us improve and further our work. Thank you. Okay, John, thank you very much. I'd like to invite uh, questions from the audience for John. Please uh, raise your hand again using the Zoom feature. If for some reason that's not working, you may speak up. We have a question from uh, Pamela. Go ahead, Pamela. Hi, uh, thank you for that great presentation. That was really um, insightful. Um, you at one point mentioned that um, you were looking at s different projects and, and one of them was the offshore wind lease areas that could be potential um, OECMs. And I was just wondering, were you able to apply the four tests that you did for the other area for the offshore wind um, leased areas? And if so, what was the outcome? Uh, yes, we, we did apply in our report. We applied we applied these criteria to a number of, of different um, uh, areas that we we pinpointed. Uh, and yes, the offshore wind was one of them. And um, yeah, it, it does it does meet all the criteria. Uh, again, the the, the OECMs are, are 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 still being defined. It's still it's still a point of, of scholarly um, uh, pursuit. Uh, it's there are a lot of gaps there. So um, in our report, we do recommend. That, um, that the New York Seascape looks at offshore wind uh, as a potential OECM. And, and they, they have been in, in other countries, in, in the North Atlantic, uh, off the coast of, uh, I wanna say Norway, um, uh, they, they're, they're, they're further along in, 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 in identifying wind areas as OECMs. All right, our next question is from Jenna Lawrence. Go ahead, Jenna. Hi, that was wonderful. That was very hopeful. Thank you for that. Um, I was just curious about seaweed farms. What what's the state of seaweed farms? And I wonder how does for-profit versus non-profit fit into this? Um, well, let me let me talk about seaweed farms first. Um, uh, currently, um, there there are none on, on the East Coast. However, um, we have one of our researchers. Uh, um, Sally uh, Song, she is uh, she's she's amazing at this. She's been deep diving into it, and um, and actually there there have been some studies of of taking seaweed farms and putting them in conjunction with the the the, the footings for. Uh, offshore wind. So they're getting two bangs for the buck. Uh, you know, the offshore wind creates a reef, uh, you know, sort of a reef effect, an artificial reef effect. And then with the the, uh, um, the seaweed, uh, it, it provides, you know, it provides more habitat cover. So um, they are, we, we in our report, we do look at seaweed farms as potential for OECMs. They're, even though they're not on the in New York bite, I think they're coming. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, a chatter about about them uh, um, starting in the Atlantic waters. Um, as far as public private partnerships, <clears throat> you know, it's a little bit outside of the scope of what our project was. We were very much looking at the research um, areas and, and sort of trying to find, trying to define what an OECM is um, with the help of our client. Um, it's been going and, and our professor, Bob, Bob Cook, we've been, we've been over this issue a number of times. Um, uh, but, but suffice it to say, I think um, those public-private partnerships will be um, crucial um, as, as these projects move forward. Great, thank you, and I love your background. <laughs> oh, it was chosen specifically for this. Um, I think it makes me look dramatic. All right, we have a few seconds left. Any other questions for John? All right, John, nicely done. Congratulations on uh, your project to you and your team. All right, keeping us uh, moving right along here, uh, I'd like to introduce our fourth presentation. Uh, again, these are all uh, capstone workshop 
uh, briefings in the sustainability management program. We've heard three presentations. We're about to hear um, two more for that program, and then we will um, close the program with a presentation from the Master of Science in Sustainability Science. So our next presentation um, has to do with uh, an environmental organization in Colombia. Kizzy Charles Guzman is, was the faculty advisor and uh, Federico Lafemina is the presenter. Welcome Federico, take it away. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. My name is Federico Lafamina, and I'm going to represent our capstone team in presenting to you today our project, Developing Aguas de Bogotá's Sustainability Report and Communication Strategy. So tonight I will share some information on climate change challenges in Bogotá. I will discuss a little bit about the client and what they do. I will talk about the project objectives, the process, deliverables, and next steps. So Bogota is the capital city of Colombia, located in the North Andes Mountains of South America. The city is surrounded by 1,800 acres of wetlands that provide habitat to a diversity of flora and fauna, and also aid in providing natural flood control. Unfortunately, Bogota's wetlands have been drastically reduced due to urbanization and are often found littered with debris. Bogota also has a history of severe flooding due to heavy rain events and inadequate drainage infrastructure that has been known to bring the city to a standstill. Climate change is intensifying these events, making mitigation and adaptation challenging, but that much more important. So Aguas de Bogota, which I'm going to refer to as the client or Aguas throughout this presentation, is a government owned utility company that performs various environmental waste and water management duties that contribute to enhancing quality of life for the inhabitants of Bogota and strives for improving sustainable development of the entire metropolitan region. Aguas has categorized their work into three business lines. There is the environmental line, which focuses on maintaining green infrastructure and restoring the local ecosystem. The waste line, which focuses on diverting reusable waste from landfills and great infrastructure maintenance. And lastly, the water line, which focuses on wastewater treatment and maintaining rainwater drainage systems. Our client played a critical role in performing maintenance on the city's rainwater systems by removing excess plant growth and debris that reduces the capacity of the drainage infrastructure. This work has minimized the impact of those heavy rain events that I discussed a little earlier. Another example of what their work is the hundreds of acres of wetlands that they clean and maintain, which reduces the degradation of natural habitats and helps preserve biodiversity. As you can see on this slide, our client is responsible for maintenance of 24% of the city's wetlands and a small percentage of other critical city services. This helps explain how Aguas is an active player in the market. However, there's plenty of opportunity for growth. So despite its key role in Bogota, our client still does not have a report that summarizes, tracks and communicates to the public all the positive environmental, social, and economic impacts that are generated by its operations. They wanted to be recognized by Bogota's inhabitants and their other stakeholders for all their efforts, which is why they came to Columbia University's sustainability management team. First, they wanted us to contribute to the preparation of their first ever sustainability report to illustrate how the company not only contributes to the city's sustainable development, but also how it aligns with our nation's long-term sustainability goals of addressing the climate crisis. Our team believes that by publishing a sustainability report to better monitor and calculate their environmental impacts, Aguas will generate the necessary support to expand its services for the government of Bogota and be able to set clear and aggressive performance goals. Second, we were tasked with developing a communication strategy to help demonstrate the company's value to its stakeholders and better engage the public on the importance of keeping Bogota's ecosystem clean and healthy for all. Our project entailed a simple five-step process. First, the team had to decide which reporting framework the client should use. We took a filtered down approach in reviewing the four most common frameworks that cities and companies use for environmental, social, and governance reporting. And we chose the one that was most relevant to utilities and the one that would best show how their work and impact align with the sustainability goals of the nation. 
based on the criteria you see on this slide, we determined that the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, were the best fit. In 2020, the nation of Colombia launched a platform to track their commitment to the 2030 agenda that encourages the companies of their country to report their contributions in favor of the SDGs. This was a major factor in our decision to choose this framework. We wanted the client's focus to align with the nation's goals. In addition, to develop an effective sustainability and communications report, we benchmarked other city and utility company reports and identified key metrics that would best convey the client's sustainability story. The most intricate part of our process was collecting the proper data from the client to align their accomplishments to these SDGs. We researched and translated into English several pages of our client's project descriptions and other materials and determined what information aligned best with certain SDGs. We then laid the information out in a request for data from the client. So for example, after reviewing their services on maintaining green infrastructure, we found that they spend a significant amount of time planting trees throughout the city. So we asked a simple question, is your organization tracking how many trees you plant annually? And if so, how many? We received over 50 data points the client pulled from previous business reports that we analyzed, organized, and drafted into 26 measurable metrics. We then strategically linked these metrics to six out of the 17 SDGs based on the client's operations and how they directly supported a specific SDG goal. So from those 26 metrics, for example, we mapped three shown on the right to SDG 6.3, which is to improve water quality, wastewater treatment, and safe reuse. Aguas contributes to this target of tracking the proportion of wastewater safely treated by operating and maintaining the wastewater treatment plant that serves a third of the city. And, diverts thousands of tons of biosolids from entering into the Bogota River. By maintaining the sanitary and combined sewer drains, Aguas improves water quality by reducing pollution of streams, rivers, and wetlands. In the interest of time, this only demonstrates one example of our efforts in mapping all those 26 metrics to the 13 relevant SDG targets. Now that we can visualize and define the impact Aguas has, we were able to develop an effective communication strategy that would best speak to the public. The team benchmarked the comm strategies of global utility companies to create a strategy that helps Aguas achieve recognition as a sustainability leader. The initiative we suggested will increase the client's footprint as increasing visibility and engagement will help them secure partnerships, sponsorships, and tangible relevance in the market, ultimately leading to an increase in their operations as a government utility. The initiatives were categorized into four groups. We had events and community initiatives. We had marketing and advertising, such as company mascot and billboard ads. We communicated the sustainability report, both internally and externally, and generational focus initiatives that specifically target Bogota's key demographics based on age. Finally, we summarized the results of our process. This is an example layout of a page from our sustainability report. The narrative we are suggesting for our client is centered around how their operations support sustainable development and highlights the client's actions to combat climate change and their impact. For example, 11,000 trees planted will result in 240 tons of CO2 sequestered annually. And the client's waste diversion program resulted in CO2 emissions reductions equivalent to the energy emissions from over 7,000 homes in one year. The image on the left is an example of the communication strategy we created, which included social media announcements and visuals of the client's accomplishments. The value that we provided to the client can now be used to demonstrate and measure the client's sustainability value. They can use these metrics as a template for the data collected and management to track their progress moving forward. They will need to finalize the sustainability report and communication strategy for their final rollout. And both of these reports will facilitate the client in engaging upper management on future goals and needed efficiencies to grow and improve their work. The client has expressed their excitement to incorporate our work into their approach. 
We have worked to develop a product that showcases how our client has the capacity to mitigate infrastructure issues that are intensifying with climate change in Bogota. By utilizing the SDGs in their report and in combination with the communication strategy, our client has the opportunity to elevate their company's voice and position themselves as a leader in the space that aligns themselves with the country's wider sustainability goals. Our client is ready to expand its work to make a greater impact as a government utility company contributing to the health and well-being of the citizens of the city and its inhabitants, especially at this time when the environmental quality of our urban natural resources is more important than ever. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Federico. Thank I'd you. like to invite questions about this presentation. Federico, I'll start us off. I, I'd like to ask you who you ultimately think is the audience for this report. And you know what that what is what does that mean for Aguas? So ultimately, I think the, the government is a good audience for this report so that they see all the good work that they're doing. I know they're a public utility, but they're they're regulated by the government. So if the government sees that they're doing all this good work and helping the city to achieve the goals of the sustainability development goals, then I think they'll get more business and more resources needed to get the business. Um, I also think it's really important for the inhabitants of Bogota to see what they're doing a little bit of encouragement, maybe also encourage people to volunteer and, and to help with the effort. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for Federico? Any other questions? Steve Children, go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> yeah, nice presentation. Um, I was trying to understand the scale of the you know the example you gave of even the let's just take the simple one of drains cleaned um does that represent you know one percent of the trains or 50 percent of the trains or 90 percent of the trains um and, and how does that compare to their market share of what part of the city that they're currently servicing yeah, the, the drains is a little bit tricky because we didn't have an exact uh, number of how much how many drains are within the city. Um, you know, the key thing for them to cleaning those drains is to prevent the rainwater from from building up and, and causing excess flooding. Um, but we, yeah, we didn't have an exact number of how many drains they uh, the entire city has. So Steve Childred raises a, a, a very valuable point in sustainability reporting, right? That, that the numbers have to be set in context in order to really truly be meaningful or to, to give the reader a, a perspective. So I think that that's a lesson for uh, everyone who is interested in sustainability reporting. And I imagine that many of the students who are about to graduate the, these programs will be asked to report in this way. So thank you, Steve, for uh, you know, pointing to, to this important issue in uh, what is you know, unregulated uh, reporting in our field. The next question is from Hannah, Hannah Friedman, go ahead. Hi, Federico, thanks for a great presentation. Um, my question can be quick. Did you consider CDP as a reporting framework for uh, Aguas? CDP? No, we did not. Okay, great. Um, any reason? Any particular reason why? Just out of idle curiosity. No, we benchmark with other. What um, the main thing was, we benchmark what other companies were doing. But um, our major factor for deciding this is the focus that Colombia as a nation had on the SDGs. They are really pushing um, to an alignment on that. They even started a platform in 2020 that allows other companies that are already using GRI reporting to show them how, how they can convert their GRI reporting to their SDG reporting. So here's your GRIs, here's how you're reporting it. Well, you can transfer that over to SDGs to help keep everybody on the same page with, within the entire nation. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Federico, thank you 
for Thank your you. presentation. Nicely done. Um, and we move on to um, the fifth presentation tonight, five of, uh, of six. This uh, next presentation has to do with um, the fashion industry and the waste associated with the clothes that we wear. Suzanne DeRoche advised this team and Stephanie Valley is the presenter. Stephanie, welcome. And unmute your mic. Yep, I figured that should probably be the first step. Thank you. Just want to make sure everyone can see my screen or the presentation. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time today. On behalf of my capstone team members, I'm pleased to present our analysis in accelerating circular supply chains for textile recycling for our client Accelerating Circularity. Accelerating Circularity is a nonprofit organization dedicated to a new apparel industry collaborative. The organization was awarded a grant from the Walmart Foundation to find new circular business models to deal with textile waste. Accelerating Circularity is supported from other organizations such as brands like Gap and VF Corp, retailers like Target, collectors and recyclers from, um, who recognize the opportunity to not only address their environmental footprint, but to use circular systems to identify cost savings and new revenue opportunities. Their goal this year is to build out a pilot to transform the current linear supply chain, which I'll explain in the next slide, into a circular supply chain within the eastern U.S., using our research as background support. The industry today is functioning in a take, make, and waste supply chain. Starting from the top of the graph, the first step is sourcing the raw materials, such as cotton. We then work down the supply chain, producing the necessary clothing for, by sewing the cotton into a t-shirt or sweater. The clothing is then sold in retail stores, consumers wear these t-shirts, and finally they might be thrown away. And where it's usually ending up is the landfill. The industry is linear, causing negative environmental impacts and continuous economic loss. So in this Zoom call, we're all wearing clothing and we're all part of this system. The rise of fast fashion has encouraged rapid mass production of clothing designed to last for very few wears. Just to give you a perspective, the equivalent of one garbage truck of textiles is landfilled or burned globally. This requires an additional demand for more land, more water, and more burning of fossil fuels. And this is inefficient from an economic perspective as well. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, there is approximately $500 billion in economic loss annually due to the underutilization of clothing and lack of recycling. A circular system can bring the used textiles like your old t-shirts back into the supply chain as a new piece of clothing. As you can see, this graph includes the same steps I walked through earlier. However, rather than landfilling the clothing or acquiring new materials in the red boxes, we've crossed them off since now instead it can be collected, sorted, and then brought back into the supply chain as either a reusable, repairable, or recycled fabric in the green boxes on the left. Think of it as a t-shirt becoming a new t-shirt after its first useful life. Retailers and brands can benefit from doing things differently and they've already started. Major companies like Eileen Fisher, Patagonia and H&M have their own take back programs. Eileen Fisher cuts up old clothing and uses those fabrics to create new pieces of clothes like sweaters and coats. Patagonia offers a lifetime warranty of free repair. And H&M offers drop-off points in their store when you drop off old clothes and get 10% off discount of your next purchase. These programs eliminate the need of sourcing raw materials and allow brands to create cater to a new set of consumers who demand environmentally friendly products. So for our capstone, we provided additional research to support accelerating circularity in their upcoming pilot of these textile to textile systems in the Eastern US. We focused in three areas. The first was analyzing the current state of the industry to map out how to reduce textile waste and where in the supply chain the material should go. We then identified key gaps in the textile to textile recycling and current best practices. And lastly, built out a roadmap to project a zero waste to landfill future. 
For our methodology, our approach for this project focused on desk-based research to understand how to reduce textile waste, who the actors in the supply chain, and what technologies are available in the industry. We then conducted interviews with current players in order to understand the major gaps in the industry and connect the dots between these players. Lastly, we laid out a framework for what data the industry would need to report in order to chart our course to a zero landfill future. I'll now walk you through an overview of our findings and the recommendations we will make for Accelerating Circularities pilot. This pyramid shows the areas that should be prioritized to reduce textile waste, starting with reuse. Reuse is like a hand-me-down to your sibling. It can occur through resale at thrift shops or donation stores like Goodwill, or rental services like Rent the Runway. Repair is clothing that needs to be fixed, maybe because of a broken zipper or a ripped sleeve, but it can then be worn again. Sorry, recycling is breaking down the material of your t-shirt and building it back into a new t-shirt. And then downcycling converts, it into some, converts the clothing into something of lower value, such as wipers or shoddy. But these materials ultimately end up in the landfill as well. Just to give you a perspective, 13.1 million tons of textile waste was generated in 2017 in the US. 87% of that went immediately into the landfill, while only 7% was considered for reuse and 6% was downcycled. This is a major opportunity for organizations like our client to maximize the efficiency of textiles, diverting them from landfill and making use of the t-shirts that already exist. It's also more complicated when you're not giving your sweater to your sister or to your friend. So in this case, to reduce textile waste, the industry must provide convenient access to collection systems. So you can throw your old t-shirts into a collection bin. Can, it also needs to improve transportation methods to get that t-shirt from the collection bins to the sortation sites and then improve the sorting process of that t-shirt, which is currently extremely labor intensive, and ultimately recycling the material of that t-shirt back in to build out a new t-shirt. So as you can see, there are several components that need to function collaboratively. So through our interviews with the players in the industry, we found three major gaps. First, we found that there is difficulty in understanding what materials are used within each piece of clothing. So for example, if there's cotton in your t-shirt versus polyester in your sweater. And yes, you are wearing plastic on your body right now, and many of us don't even know it, let alone the folks trying to recycle your sweater. So Eon is a company that is solving this challenge by working with brands to supply a QR code, to apply a QR code, which provides a digital identity to every garment. So each t-shirt or sweater or pair of jeans has its own individual QR code that tells you what it's made out of. And this affects the whole supply chain. The second gap focused on high collection cost and lack of access to, co to collect textiles that are being disposed of from our homes. A truck doesn't come to pick up your old clothing the same way it comes every Tuesday to pick up your garbage. So TexAid is a company we interviewed and who is working with retailers and brands in order to collect the clothing needed to recycle. So instead of a truck, um, truck coming to your house, TexAid makes the drop-off bins very convenient for you to drop off yourself. And the third and final gap we identified is the need for innovative solutions to reimagine how retailers can sell clothing. The Hong Kong Research Institute of Textile and Apparel is developing a mechanical recycling process that can be used at retail stores. They're partnering with H&M and customers can go into the store and insert an old sweater into a machine and within a few minutes walk out with a re-knitted sweater of a different style. Overall, these companies show us innovation is possible. However, we have a long way to go and the industry doesn't yet know how to answer the question, what will be the roles of reusing compared to repairing and recycling of our clothing? Our final set of findings was focused on building out a roadmap of where the industry needs to go. As you can see in this graph, this is a projection of a zero landfill future by 2045. This is a conceptual framework. It provides directional results to show our client the opportunity of e for each strategy in reducing textile waste, whether that's reuse, repair, or recycling. 
using EPA's 2017 textile waste generated data as our baseline scenario, our model takes into account the current state of the industry and uses best available data to collect the annual growth rate for reuse, repair, recycling, and downcycling. The red in the graph shows how the majority of clothing is ending up in the landfill, with a small amount being reused in bright blue or downcycled in light green. As the years go, by landfilling and as the years go, by landfilling in red reduces while the progression of repairing in turquoise increases. Recycling is still not largely available today, but is projected to become more viable in the future due to technological advancements. So as you can see, recycling in the bright green begins to increase in 2032 and grows to be a much bigger piece of the zero landfill future. Our recommendations come from a combination of the three sections of our findings. The te textile industry, as I mentioned, has a long way to go to a zero landfill future. Despite much of our research, the industry still lacks a lot of data. Therefore, in our report, we recommend how the client could collect the data in their pilots and which data points would be most useful. In particular, the pilot could analyze the potential of repair where data is particularly lacking. We also found that adopting technologies is essential in order to better collect, sort, and recycle textiles, and this will require cross industry collaboration. Lastly, it's important for Accelerating Circularity to work with the members to build out and better understand the financial landscape in this market. This will help the members understand the cost savings and revenue generation opportunities in joining a textile to textile recycling industry. I wanna thank you all for your time and please let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, questions for her in this presentation, please use the raise your hand function to ask your question. You all wear clothes, I think it's safe to say, so you must all have lots of questions. All right. Hi, first George. One, first one is from Sahil, go ahead, Sahil. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. So I had a quick question. So I work in the fast moving consumer goods industry more on like the chemical product side. And one of the pushbacks that we typically hear from a recycling standpoint is um, at some point these materials when we recycle them a few times the quality of them degrades. So one of the issues that we look at in circularity is that eventually at some point we do need to put fresh raw materials back into the system. So I think the idea of like, you know, having the QR codes and having an identity for every single garment is great for actually sorting these different types of materials because it's the same issue with people recycling different types of plastics. We have one through seven and people get confused about that pretty frequently. But is there any part of your analysis that focuses on the need to put in fresh material to increase the quality because eventually recycling basically becomes downcycling? at some point in the lifetime of the material. Yeah, so we did see um, there, so there's two types of recycling, mechanical and chemical. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we did see is that if you're recycling just cotton products, you do need a certain percentage of raw material of cotton to be put into that. It's not as, as much as what, currently is needed because it's just a hundred percent fresh new cotton. Um, but that's, but we've noticed that the market is changing a lot more to the polyester side, which is actually more plastics related. Um, right. and what you can use for that is the chemical recycling, which basically you would put the clothing in this like vat of chemicals and it would break it down to then separate what, um, the polyester that you would need that would then melt into these little pellets. And then you can, build that to become yarn. Okay. So there are these alternatives um, kind of occurring as the industry is evolving because they're obviously concerned about climate change and the reduction of, you know, sourcing and things like that. So the, the plastic is kind of being brought into that through the chemical recycling options. Okay, right, we have very a couple cool. more questions. Let's try to get to them over the next couple of minutes. Uh, next up is Mia Sorvi. Go ahead, Mia. I think that was a great presentation. Um, I had a question about your graph about how um, it looks like use will sort of peak in 2030 and then that goes down and recycling takes over. And I was wondering about the analysis behind that, why, why use will reduce after 2030. 
is that just like percentage wise or absolute numbers? I hope it's just well, percentage. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So the biggest challenge that the industry is having right now is that recycling isn't super available because it's very currently right now it's very labor intensive and um since our focus was within the u.s there aren't a lot of recyclers in the u.s right now there's like i think less than five maybe um so the reason why we started it off at 2030 was because we have seen through our research, we've seen that within the next five years, there's see, there going to be an uptick in investment in building out these more um, mechanical and chemical recycling options that will be more viable to then have recycling be part more um, a bigger part of the overall roadmap to um, waste reduction of textiles. There was another hand up. Uh, that has been taken down. So, and we're at 7.30. So we'd like to thank you, Stephanie, for an interesting presentation. Nicely done to you and your team. Thank you. And